G'day guys, it is The Coach here. Hope you are kicking ass, taking names, and all praising Slanesh, and what better way... Oh, actually, you got the purple. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know if you, you did, did that on purpose, but yeah, did, yeah. we are... <laughs> well, oh, fancy pen. I'll Maybe I need it, to yeah. get... Fancy lights. $30 off Amazon, mate. It's, it's well worth. <laughs> hey, shout out to the patrons. We'll get some uh, fancy pants lights. But uh, yeah. we are talking all things Hedonites of Slanesh. It is the 2020 review. So the FAUSQ has come out for this little bad boy. And um, I have a very special guest. I have uh, making his debut coming out of the way of Facehammer. It is Russ Veal, um, who I've been talking pretty pretty in depth about Slanesh because I don't quite get it. Um, <laughs> I've played a lot of old Slanesh, and I got I got locust many times, and I haven't actually had a chance to play against the new Slanesh. I had a couple of them attend a one day tournament that I ran recently and they, they kind of did okay. And I think the challenge that I've, I've seen for those players in the community is that they're trying to play the old Slanesh and they haven't quite grasped the way that they've got to adapt. And I think fundamentally, when I look at this book, um, it's changed. The way I run this army has changed. So I really want to crack that nut and kind of get an understanding of how you're looking at this and how you're considering the rules. <laughs> ah, it's, it's a good it's, uh, nut to crack. Well, it is. It's it's fun, right? Because it's journey before destination and no one wants to just start off with the best thing in the world and be like, oh, well, that was easy. No, I just, it's just repeat the formula, you know, KO one drop, whatever. Um, and so, um, yeah, for me, Sinesh has been a bit of a journey um so and i think you're right that the old sanesh i played it at the etc um very last minute actually um did pretty well uh, it was a pretty I, I wrote my list to be anti daughters of cain um so that worked except for one game which marathi went a bit cray cray um but it was it was good and and the problem is i sold my old sanesh army because i really didn't like the one dimensional play of it and the uh, popularity of it actually, which I know sounds a bit bizarre, but I kind of like to be on a book that isn't um, everywhere because people aren't prepped for it. They're not, they're not used to playing against it. They don't know exactly what everything does. Um, and Sinesh has never really been my like first love. It's not like I love Sinesh, so I'm going to play Sinesh. It's like, I, I picked them up for ETC, didn't really like it. The new book, obviously, doing the podcast, you review um, battle tomes and books and things, and obviously I sort of have to look at them in detail. Um, and Sinesh kind of, like, drew me in uh, more and more. I looked at it. I don't know if it's kind of like the first bit was free and then the more you have, the more you get addicted to it. Um, and I think it's because of... As a as a player, I quite like the challenge and the the dip, the depth of it. And the more I looked at it, it was like, how do I get the most out of this? How do I squeeze the juice out of this book? And it's very challenging um, to put one point, and it plays completely differently to the old book. So I think it's I can understand why people are disappointed. If you were into the old book and this come out, your army almost is completely different. I think it's the same feeling Silver Death players went through. Mm. If, if that makes sense. Um, no, it makes perfect sense, for, especially for uh, maybe not for the new people. I, I, I put up a video recently about like getting into the hobby, and I think I made a joke about mm. uh, Sylvaneth will come back again, and people like, mm. Sylvaneth had a day? Like, they had a day yeah, in the yeah, sun. Yeah. I'm like, actually, Sylvaneth yeah. scared most people. Like, turn one, just drop down all the trees, all the dryads. There was like a, you know, they were causing headaches for a while, and um, I, I, when, when I got jet. to – legit thing where you're like i'm going to the event how do i deal with silver death like it was a thing you had to think about you know oh like you, you had to get some pre-screening and just to move up just to try to push mm. those trees away from the from from you as much as possible but this is not the silver death show and bonus points is what jerome's just pointed out is that um as of recording we have yeah. an announced set of new slanesh models coming down the track um I thought they were just conversions. I thought it was just like a hobby roundup and um, some <laughs> really cool converter had c created these twins and like a levitating keeper of secrets. And then I actually looked and I'm like, holy shite, these are incredible. Um, yeah. And, but, but back to, the, back to your point, 
you know, when I when I played Slanish for the first time or played against Slanish, it was very much like being hit by a Mack truck. They set you up for this massive charge. Um, you'd have a flying keeper of secrets with a thermal rider cloak. You would have two to three keepers of secrets to kind of um, make you make me fight last. And just by sheer overwhelming of almost like what the eels do when you when you have yeah. IDK setting up for the turn three, it's just this one wave of just crushing me as much as possible and and using the depravity to get those heroes back on the board. And, you know, you never really saw demonettes. You never really saw other units. But when I was reviewing this book, because the play style seemed to have changed, more of the units seem to be unlocked, let alone the fact that you've now got mortals, you've got Sigvold, you've got Glutos. I think... Yeah. The style has changed, but also you've now got options. Yeah, and and chaos. Um, and I know we'll probably get a um, comment that it's not in the battle tomes, so it doesn't count. But chaos have this weird, um, which never another book really has, where um, slaves to darkness, battle tome. You know, wrath of the ever chosen, broken realms, Bellacore, You know, they they all interact with that book to make it more than the sum of its parts so i think if you check um the head knight's book and you look at it and you go uh but as soon as you then look at wrath slaves it opens up more options now i know maybe purists out there will say no don't do it that's completely up to you but i think if you're trying to get the most out of it you have to use the best option from your varied toolboxes to come to the point and i think um it's definitely it's definitely like chaos is a little bit bitty for me but that kind of opens up um opportunities i think is probably the best way to look at it yeah and for anyone who hasn't seen this show this style of show in the past from me um what i'm going to get russ to do is share some of his thoughts around the allegiance rules um we'll talk about the terrain we'll talk about how he looks at the rules because there is a lot and i guess if i'm a new player and i'm looking at all of these things that i get it could be quite easy to fall down a trap like i'm going to build a, a list that's all about summoning bodies um, and summoning bodies is great, but you've also then got to score objectives. You've also got to kill your opponent. So what's the balance and how are all of these rules kind of coming to to Russ's list? So um, maybe before I get to that, is there anything that kind of really drew you to Slanesh compared to some of the other armies that you've been running? Um, actually, I was the opposite. I was not interested at all. Um, when, they, when they were um play tested i was kind of on a bit of a break so i didn't really look to them then um because life was busy for me um now when i got the because we get to see the pdf a few bit early before the book comes out um when i saw that and i was i saw the models first and i was like wow amazing so i have a look at the book so that drove me to look back at the book when i looked at the book i was like uh mm, oh that's a bit mm, and i was a bit like probably like everyone else a bit disappointed a bit like well i can't really see the power in it and then as it came to doing our content um and i sort of had to sit down with the the pre-copy and, and look at it and then raf of the ever chosen because i was looking at the slaves list so that kind of raf could come to the fore and i started looking at different things and we we're looking at sigvold and we've done a few and me and byron kind of went on the same journey where we had initial thoughts <clears throat> And as we've gone through doing our follow-up shows and we've looked back at it, our process, we haven't, I mean, because of the UK, we haven't really been able to play any games. I know Byron's had one or two, but because of lockdown is, you know, we only just come out of it again and we haven't really been able to play any games. But the point is, is that as we came out, um, we kind of started to look at it and go, actually, uh, we started to change our initial reactions and what our initial lists were. Um based on theory and a little bit of TTS sort of testing and stuff like that. And actually come to a point where we're like, actually, and it was quite funny because we're independently having the same journey. Um, and he's a little bit further ahead than me now and I'm pinching ideas off of him, but um, which I'll credit as we go through the show. <laughs> but and, I, and, yeah. and that's the whole point of this show is just to be, for you to give your ideas. And if someone's like, oh, I don't really like X unit or I really want to make um, Hellstriders work, or I'm absolutely, mm. I've put all of my heart and soul into my two keepers of secrets. How do I make it work? You can obviously season to taste, but take the theory and, and make it your own. Yeah. And I think you can with Sunesh, and I think that's the 
when we I was prepping for this, me and Byron, we were sat. Out, I was sat in my garden. He was he was obviously in Manchester, but we were sat in the sun having a chat on the phone, writing lists together. And I think we wrote about thirty different lists. Um, some lists were double keeper. Some were, you know, some were glutos based. Some some were, um, you know, obviously lurid hay sigval, which is where I lean. That's what I like. Um, and it's not to say that that's better than the other lists. It's just um, it just means that. I just gonna give him the cold shoulder. What's that about? No. Um, so it's not that, like um those lists, you know, aren't viable. And and like when I show my list, I'm sure there'll be some comments about the 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 heavy borrow of, of other books. But I think what I'm trying to do is think of the tournament environment it which is and what would be uh give me the best starting point. And there's no reason why you if you really like twin souls and you know pain bringers you can build a list around them but will it be as effective as another list i don't know depends on your meta and it depends but at the end of the day it's like play what you love and you know and and i i, I know people will scoff but i i just don't think winning's that important like i think winning with something you love and really having a win that counts i think is more important it's more rewarding to go three and two win free games with a list that you think is maybe a little bit underpowered than take a net list go three or four and one and lose to a good player at the top table you're never going to get to that top point if your goal is to get good at age of sigma a book like this is extremely high skill floor um i would say that it's not forgiving at all i think if you're a new player it, it is going to be a struggle but the struggle will be worth it I, I when I got really good at Warhammer in old edition, I started off with a high elf army um, using MSU mm -hmm. high elves without going into too much detail. But basically, I went to an event and they put me in a group of fluffy players or underpowered lists. They used to call it the fluffy few and they had the dirty dozen. And it gave yeah. me, it was a, a tournament in Wales. So they gave, that was my first podium, or yeah, first podium. They gave me a bonus for taking it. And it was actually a very strong list and I smashed it and I, you know, I podium that event. And it's like you, you, the first day you only played against those soft lists. And the second day you went into the normal field. I think I lost one of the games to dark elves, but basically like, I think you, you become better player. And then when you want to really turn it on, you can switch to a, another list and say, let's now go to a more, competitive build and because of all the skill set you've built up and the game skills you've learned you're you're going to be in a better place to win with that list uh and, and you'll understand the meta a bit better because you have to try harder if that makes sense no it makes it makes perfect sense and i think right now um you know the book has only just been faq'd and uh, i'm sure as people start taking them to tournaments as people start practicing with them um you know there's been a lot of people talking about you know how to maximize depravity through the archers people are still thinking do you know do i run my double keeper of secrets how does sigvol come into play how does archeon come into play there's obviously so many questions we've got new bellicor coming um you're in this constant environment of testing and i think um a question i do want to ask you is um does this book stand alone as a good book like could i like do i need wrath of the ever chosen do i need all these additional supplements to to make a competitive list when i say competitive i'm talking that three two army i'm not talking four one not talking five one because that's where slanish was at one point You'd build just this army and you would just, yeah. you would, you, you didn't pilot the army. You just pushed it forward, rolled a bunch of dice and you won. Yeah, you just pushed um, it into them. They couldn't fight. You rolled all your dice. That was it. So I think, I think I would say you're handicapping yourself um, if you don't, because when it's tested and when it's talked about, all those things are considered. So when like things are adjusted, it's what if you use this? What if you use that? So we, when we play test, we talk about the spectrum of the allegiance ability, not the battle tone contents per se. So you certainly could um, if you wanted to. I think there are stuff in the book you can stick with uh, and be competitive. I think if you do a glutos focus list, I just think 
the the wrath of the ever chosen stuff is for me is almost auto include because it just makes those invaders and pretenders better um with no cost really uh the only cost you have really is the is the artifact and you really want command point generation but you normally want to run a formation so i would say that um yeah i mean you could would i maybe but i just don't see the point in limiting yourself as my it it reminds me as a cities of sigma player because i get <clears throat> one in every four that can be stormcast yeah. i can, you know i play a lot of tempest ice so one in every four can be carriage and overlords it's like saying no i'm just going to run my cities of sigma no ko no stormcast um just stick to what's in the book and i, I could build a competitive list don't get me wrong um, there is some good stuff in cities, but it just becomes so much better when I look at mm. those additional synergies. And I know um, people who love their slangors um, were, were really hoping for that yeah. integration to to do the exact same thing. So my heart feels for you guys. Uh, let's make slangors and Beast of Chaos great again. Um, but yeah, let's talk I, about the... Go I on, please. You, I think with that, like, yeah, 100%. There are stuff that could have been done better. I think Vince did a really good job of looking at it from a design point of view of of opportunities missed, I guess I would use. And, and 100%, I think, could it have come out in a better state? Yes, but I treat this as the first Header Knights book, not the second, because um, it's almost like the first book was like a Demons of Sunesh book, if in a way. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is a Head Knights book. And actually, I know they were called Head Knights, but for me this this is the first draft and it will get it will get next time it gets done and and this for me it's it's a long term investment not a short term gain as i think when you play aos if you want to be on this like roller coaster ro wheel of buying a new army every 6 weeks you know of the latest thing dip it you know cover it in contrast get it on the table play one event change it then that's completely you do you but that's that's not what i want and i think that if you're playing a long term approach investing in it now will only give you benefits in the future when it does get a new right and you also get points adjustments i think it's only going to get stronger not going to get weaker cuz it's considered to be weak so that's that's just my two cents on it let, let's let's hope we learn from Sylvaneth. We know Sylvaneth would uh, disagree with that, um, but <laughs> but unless you're Laurie, Laurie's really very good with his Sylvaneth. He would he would challenge me. But yeah. when I look at these rules, when I look at your your generic legion, you know, um, allegiance abilities for the Hedonites, um, you know, page seventy nine of my book, you're going to get yourself a couple of things here. You're going to get yourself um, your euphoric killers. You get the locust diversion. You get the feast of deprav depravity, depravity. Um, so, so I guess when I look at this, I'm curious to understand at a at a very top level list building, are all of these things super important to your list discussion? Are you are you building a, around generating as much depravity as possible? Um, and especially because depravity has now changed. Now depravity is all based around at the end of the battle shock phase or the start of the battle shock phase, and it's almost like the the reverse of corn corn wants to destroy the units you want to just you want to just do some damage but not necessarily wipe them out completely you know locus has changed um how do you look at these rules and and what's important to your list building um so obviously the host is is kind of important um so that that will dictate some of your decisions um I've always run invaders. It's always been my favorite, even when Pretenders was the, the top cheese with uh, the old book. Um, I think Laurid Hayes is hands down the best. Um, that's just my two cents, and I can explain that a bit later. Um, Euphoric Killers, you know, it's only head and night models, which is the change from Sunesh, which is, I know, which is what the Depraved Grove and things like that. Um, you know they they lose out um and i think what this does that does want you to lend from the battle tone more because you want the head knight keyword um honestly there is some stuff that it makes a difference on I, it's not a massive thing for me i think it makes demonettes competitive um without it demonettes are over costed and not worth taking um so in a sanesh army i think it makes of like a big demonette unit quite scary um it's a i look at it as like a bonus i don't 
a lot of people when they look at stats they don't really consider it i think as well um it's quite an easy thing just to forget about uh, <laughs> so you just get, but it's quite good um especially like when you use the keeper or something like that and you pop a couple sixes and you can you can spike damage quite hard um lo the locust is interesting just just a question before we move to locust with the euphoric killers you can see that um if the unit has 20 or more models it's going to increase the the, the two attacks on a six to a three is that now suggesting to you that you know if i was going to take let's say demonet unit would you because and, and most of the time i didn't really see those big blocks of 30s i would always see you know units of 10 because i would try to maximize their heroes is this when you read this are you now thinking if you were going to take something like demonets i really want to maximize and, and get that unit of 30 to get those three hits on a six or it, again is that just something that if you happen to find yourself in your list awesome but just knowing that I, you get two attacks on a six is good enough. I, I think for me, it's only, I would run MSU, so many small units in Sinesh, because that gives you more chances to get depravity. Um, I think running Demonets in your starting list, 20 or 30, I don't see the worth. But what it does come into play for is the summoning. So when you summon 20 Demonets, they have a, they can reroll their charge. Um, so mm. they could be summoned, they have a good chance of getting that charge in and you know it's not guaranteed but have a free reroll on that charge and if they go in because you, you can activate them first they'll get that bonus and actually demonet units charging you from a summon they are extremely extremely choppy so i i think for me originally we were fit talking about running glutos not running a keeper and then summoning a keeper later I actually think you need to start with the Keeper of Secrets and summon stuff like Seekers or Demonettes um, and potentially the Rapture, stuff that can impact the turn they come down. Um, mm. And and your Furic Killers comes into the summoning pool. I'm not saying you can't run a unit of 30 Demonettes. But for me, no, no, no. I'd rather not. No, but, I, but if I look, if I looked at these Allegiance, because again, we're talking at the very top of the list building, you know, when I look at that rule and go, oh, if my units are 20 are going to hit me three attacks, I'm going to build all of my Demonate units as as 30s or 20s. What I'm hearing is that because of what we'll get to later, depravity, it's probably better off thinking about those smaller units to generate more depravity than trying to get more attacks. Yeah, and like even just getting one extra hit is good enough. And then the, the point is, is that if Demonets get, if you've got a big blob of them and you're like they're really good when they've got more than 20 they're quite squishy so it's very easy for your opponent to take them below 20 and then they don't really have the worth and you've invested that 120 130 points and it's gone um yeah i, I think it's a good thing that it's not marauders and chaos warriors as well because otherwise you just wouldn't see any of the sns core units so you don't really anyway but it's uh, i'll explain that yeah more. I'm gonna get yeah, we, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get to those lists very soon. Um, and you do have some Chaos Warriors in some of them. So <laughs> <laughs> opening yeah. the Christmas present a little bit for you guys. Um, and again, you know, you, season to taste, build the way you want to build. Um, so we were moving to, to Locust, which um, that had a big change. That had a really big change. And I think mm. um, probably the one that surprised the most amount. And it actually had a lot of iterations, right? Um, it got yeah. FAQ'd and now it's been reined in all together and, and reworded but how do you think about locus now um it's more technical now um obviously like so the way it works now is that you can stop people being able to pile in um off your demons um if you create a demon it's a little bit more reliable i think it's extremely technical now um it's not your main it's not the main thing that makes sunesh good it's a tool you can use in certain circumstances and you can build a list around it uh, particularly if you use it i think with six inch pylons and reach um so for me it's good it's good at m minimizing attacks back on your big characters if you charge on the side and you do it and you go well you can't really pile in around me um it's not a guarantee uh it's certainly nowhere near as powerful as it used to be but let's be honest the old ability was was busted for a lot of people it, it, if you played a combat army you pretty much couldn't pl beat sunesh unless you had yeah, some like island shenanigans or shooting basically 
you know, like like if, if anyone watches Warhammer Weekly, which I'm sure most of my, my, my people do, you know, you hear this term NPE or a negative play experience. And to me, Locus was one of those because when you charged in two keepers of secrets, you've got the epitome as well, doing it on a four plus, and you're just making my units fight last. And just the sheer amount of damage that can, can happen, it, it, you, you're basically sitting there going, what's the point of me playing? Like, yeah. like I, I could literally go to the bar, I could go to the toilet, and you could play the game without me. Like, go play a computer game. Um, but, in, you know, and that was because you made people fight last. Um, but in saying that now, it, it's quite interesting because it means that I just can't pile in, very similar to what the Sharks do with their nets. Um, so how does that come into, like, play style? Are you... Because I, th- I think for me, like right now, you know, the cap that I'm wearing, I'm a Gargant player. So I'm like, lol, I've got two and three inch attacks. Mm-hmm. I don't care. But I guess for those those armies that don't have all the three inch and two inch attacks, um, it's really reducing the amount of damage that you're going to take. Again, it doesn't really affect monsters because obviously like it's, it's good against horde units. So for me, it's it's when you go into that 30 witch elf unit or the, the sisters, you charge them and you go where they've got a six inch pile in, but they can't actually use it. It's it's good as well for pinning uh, Lumineff um, uh, when, you know, hurricane units that want to pile in away from you because they can't pile in, so they can't use that rule. Um, so it's not amazing, but like what I the way I use it is um, with a keeper or, or the mask and then using like slick blade seekers to pile in from outside of, of three inches with their two inch reach allows you to and then you can obviously trigger from the keeper fight twice so it's very situational um but there are times in the game and i think like these sort of pile in nuances are lost on tts a little bit i think that you you can use it to even if you mitigate two or three people attacking you it's still that's still potentially not going to kill you then so you can guarantee you're not going to die basically which is is worth in itself because then that's depravity then that's you know you're pinning them in their turn yeah you might fail it next turn you might not roll it but i i I really just think it's um it's a good way for mitigate hordes of lots of models with lots of attacks or stuff that's got stupid pile in shenanigans and this was the point that I was going to make in retort was that um, now you really got to um, not charge your keeper of secrets into the the middle of the uh, the, the unit. You will really want to be thinking about tagging. You want to go to the side. You want to look at the area that you can receive the least amount of damage in return because they're not going to be able to pile in. So um, how how do I uh, yeah positioning is probably going to be really critical as opposed to just mm. running forward. Which is why I like the change because it means you have to play better to utilize it and it's not as no brainer. Whereas before you could literally just like you say, push your army forward, roll a few two ups back in the day, and then uh, just make everyone go last and you just don't need to worry about it. And I think now you've actually got to, but it can also work a little bit when you get charged, right? Because like I think if they someone just makes a charge on you, you know, and they've only got like a couple guys in range. The pylons you use to maximize attacks. If you stop the maximization, it, it works. You know, it's not it's not game breaking. It's not it's not. You know, if someone's if if you had to pick a rule in the book as the best rule in the book, it wouldn't be that rule. But it's a nice to have. You know, yeah, and it might force them to to use a command point because knowing that you could make them potentially uh, not pile in. Yeah, um, that actually could force them to spend a command point just to re-roll the charge or to get that extra range. Yeah. So, um, on its own, not <coughs> as not as impactful as we're used to, but probably it'll be really surprise you um, what you can do with the rule. But I, I can appreciate that people are probably disappointed. Locus changed. I guess so. The lot. No, I mean, like not anyone general, who plays like, against it, but uh, well, I mean, like, people, people, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, they're not the people that are tuning tuning in. The people who are tuning in are the, the slanish <laughs> people who are like, I want my old locus. But then the last one, I guess, is depravity. So you've you've still got the ability to generate depravity points, which is awesome. It's changed a little bit. So I guess the twofold piece is one, how important is depravity and list generate as a, a unit generation in, into your list design. Um, and then probably two is when I look at this table, um, knowing that I can only summon one thing per turn, um, are there things that you are drawn to more than others? Yeah, um, I think depravity is probably the most important rule in the book. Um, 
I love the change. I think now that it doesn't, it's not about multi wound characters or, or your heroes. It's about um, your units and chipping away. But the good thing about it as well, it doesn't matter if you've got allied units, non Sunesh units, it doesn't matter. Um, so for me, that depravity is key if you want to be competitive with Sunesh because you need to summon those units because you're paying a premium for your army because these po- these things are woven into the points, you need to lean into it. And they went up, right? Like when, I, I remember when yeah. I was doing the, the list reviews for Daughters of Cain and Slanesh that came out at the same time, most of Daughters of Cain went down in points. And then as I'm going up and I'm looking at Slanesh, actually a lot went up. And I'm sitting there going like Hellstriders, for example, I think they used to be 100 points. Yeah. And now they're like 150. And I'm scratching my head going, Why? Why are Hell Striders 150 points? Like, like, why do these things go up? Um, so I um, guess that the, you got a retort. A difficult question to answer that. <laughs> it, was a, it, it was a rhetorical, rhetorical. question. Yeah. I'm not. I could give I'm you some like insight, pointing but a, I probably shouldn't. But you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure your non-disclosure agreements uh, might stop <laughs> us from from revealing that. But maybe more importantly, and and um, bringing it back. So. I saw a lot of people taking things like the Bliss Barb Archers and mm. they're like, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna take a big block of, or multiple blocks of these archers and I'm going to split my attacks. I'm going to do a couple, you know, half here, half here to try to yeah. generate the most amount of depravity. What are your thoughts on that strategy? Is it is that something that's um, viable or do you think that's kind of like a trap? I It's a bit of both really because the, the, the issue you have with Sunesh is the battle line. Like the battle line are – I actually like Hell Striders. Um, I actually, I actually model what my list include them, um, but the problem is, his points are so tight. The best place you can save those points is to drop those Hell Striders to Chaos Warriors. You're saving 50, 60 points per unit, so that potentially gives you an extra elite bunny quote unit, or an endless spell and another thing or another character. Um, so for me, the um, they honestly. I, I think shooting is important. I think the Bliss Barb archers on steeds are a trap. Um, and originally I thought they were quite good. And actually looking at the maths and what you get, you get a lot of wounds. They're quite spongy, which is quite nice for depravity. But the price tag is high. And I know they're only 20 points more than the foot archers, but they generally do more damage. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I would... I'm not saying you shouldn't run them. I've I've written this with two units or one unit. I think you need to have a unit that shoots, um, whether that's you know bliss barb seekers or bliss barb archers or some other way. You need some way to do damage at range. You could replace some of the shooting with magic, but obviously techless is a thing. So if you're relying on endless spells, then that's probably not going to work for you. Um, so there are there are things you need to consider. I think um, yeah, it depends on the meta. But you need to do damage at range at some point. I think having a plan to have lots of archers. I mean, you got to have stuff sit at the back on objectives usually. So having something that can sit on an objective and do some damage and potentially get some points is not a bad thing. Um, so yeah, I do. I do like the archers. I just um, but, but, they are a but, heavy but price I- tag. So. But not doubling down, and like I guess some of the early discussion was, well, let's take multiple units. Like let's take two, three. They're not let's, let's, No, no, and I think that, <laughs> that was kind of the point. That was kind of the point that they're I wanted expect, to draw more expensive out than that. sentinels, but they're not sentinels. <laughs> No, they're not. They're not <laughs> shooting at thirty inches. You know, fishing uh, for sixes mores. and ignoring no, line of sight. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the point that I want to try, try to make or hopefully draw out was that um, they're good to have, but I wouldn't double down on them and build this strategy around, right, I'm going to have three no. or four units of Bliss Barb. They're going to split their attacks and do, you know, two different units per uh, – to target two units per unit. They're going to generate eight depravity, and then I'm going to do this And because logically it's a trap. I think the early on we were talking about putting a keeper not in the list, and then you buy archers – and then the idea is to try and generate depravity and straight away you've got an issue that um, you've got issues that you're like, okay, what you've got to do is shoot um, like to get the points to summon the thing, but you've spent more points on those units to give you that and you've weakened your combat power. So then what you've done is you've gone, well, actually 
my depravity is now only going to give me a keeper and that might not be at the time I need it. And I've poured two, 300 points into generating depravity at range. Whereas I could just spend those points on a keeper of secrets. And then I can use the depravity to fill gaps, capture objectives, give me demonets or seekers in rapturous with a shooting attack is also good. Um, but it's not to say that you shouldn't have at your archers. I still think one or two units is fine. I just wouldn't run like 40 of them. Like, And I wouldn't run yeah. a unit above min size in my personal point. So, so, so what are your favorite things to summon? Is it is it going to be uh, heroes? Is it going to be troops? Is it a bit of... It's Obviously, seekers. scenario and opponent yeah. is going to vary. Also, also, it means if you've lost your keeper, you probably want to get one back. Um it, it depends on the situation, but I, I think Seekers of Sinesha are probably the, the best, cheapest option. Um, Demonettes and in, Infernal and Rapturous, and potentially the free Seeker Chariots if you've actually wanted to build them. But those are the ones that I lean to as as summonable units. Um, AOS Crusader did want to know a bit about the, the Chariots, and um, <laughs> there think- is some builds, but... Um, I think you'll be surprised how good it could be, actually, because you they're qu- they're a little bit overpriced for me. Um, but the thing that they do mortal wounds uh, when they charge, it, you're you can you can get generate quite a lot of depravity doing that, and um, they're quite spongy because you can if you multiple charge them as separate units. I mean, I I haven't personally looked at it. Godseeker's never been my thing. I, the the thing for me, I'm I'm quite model driven as well, and for me, like the thought of doing more than, like even building three of those chariots just turns me cold. Um, I just, I I know that I don't think I don't think it's a bad thing. I think you could do a list with them. I, I certainly don't think they're awful. Um, I just for me, it's just not for me. So it's uh, but yeah, do what you want. I think do. the thing I think the thing that I picked out from this particular book is that. In the old book, there seemed to be like two different lists that were the most important builds. There was like certain yeah. builds, you know, you take double keeper or a keeper and a lawnmower, the chariot, yeah. you'd have the infernal rapturous, you'd have, you know, absolute minimum units of, you know, usually mm-hmm. demonettes. Um, like there was a build. Um, yeah. One, and the reason I wanted to bring up the Fane of Slanesh is um, one, I just want you just some high level thoughts on how you use it, but two, it had an interesting update as well because um, you know one of the one of the strategies that used to be um, the the the, the anti um, Slanesh strategy was just shoot the heroes. If you take down the heroes, that denied them the ability to summon. But now this bad boy can summon as well. So. Um, how do you think about the uh, the fane? Um, any any considerations? Is it just there, or are you are you thinking about it a little bit differently? Um, as I say, like depravity is important, so your heroes are important, and the fane gives you two things. One, it gives you a conduit. It also gives you a very nice piece of terrain to hide your little hero behind. Um, so for me, the fane is kind of critical. It also gives you a depravity generation because you can ping yourself a wound. And, and with the wording of depravity, because you only have to have suffered a wound that turn, if you then later heal the wound back, you still get the depravity for it. So if you're running like Born, a lot of the Snash spells are short range, you turn one, you know, and if you've got stuff like Rod of, um, like uh, anything that burns, like Cameo the Dark Prince, you, you burn it for a command point, you could burn that artifact on your keeper and you get a permanent game buff um, on the first turn, then you can cast Born of Dawn, Damnation, get the D3 wounds back, or, or, or Progeny, if you've got that. Um, so the Fane is super important. I think um, some of the things that scare me are things that can turn it off. Like, you, you've seen, uh, there, like I think, Severith and, and like the uh, Gatebreaker can smash terrain. So um, it is, it's, it's a little bit scary if it can get destroyed, because um, obviously you need the, the rules on it. Um, particularly in late game, it gives you a place to summon an anchor point, I'd say. Um, and it always has been uh, pretty important. Um, so, yeah, if, definitely um, definitely have one. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, it's good for just putting your, you know, your little hero behind it, like your shard speaker or something like that, because you don't want them being seen um, to be shot at, basically. No, no. Um, what one burning question before I move into your actual lists is, um, 
in the past, people used to put the fanes of Slanesh quite aggressively. You know, they would bring, they would put it as far forward as possible. Um, you know, chuck the artifact in, um, and you know, like then just move along. I, I started getting this theory that you know, because I can now summon from the the fane of Slanesh, I might want to, re- I want, I might want to deploy it. I guess further back in my home zone, as opposed to mm. you know closer to the center, because you know I, I can summon if it's going to be wholly within twelve, but then nine away from the enemy. So by having this like almost safe space, I can still always generate and summon something within nine. Um, have you found that to be true, or am I just making stuff up? It depends what you're playing against. I, I always think, where do I want my anchor to be in terms of where do I want my caster to like. If you're running a shard speak or you've got like a core blob stuff that's your home units, you want the fane in a position where you can move up the table and it's still relevant. If it's too far back, then summoning from it is kind of like, well, yeah, but there's that you're not going to be able to even be within nine to charge an enemy unit, so you're just going to get killed the next turn. So, personally, I would rather play a little bit more aggressively with it because if you're at the stage where you've only got your fane left to summon, you've probably lost anyway. Um, so it's it's almost like put it where you think you're going to need your caster that you've got. If you've got a contorted epitome, for example, you're going to it's quite fast. Don't put it like on your three inch line at the back of the table. Put it on your twelve inch line, or, or put it on the eighteen inch line, really, because you're going to move up behind it, and that gives you your anchor point. Um, you know, because you, you just need to be where it's going to be impactful. It, it's completely situational on what you're playing against, what scenario it is, what the board layout is. And I'd say you'll just, as practice goes on, you you know what you how you play with it. And some people won't use it as, I usually use it as an anchor for my wizard at the back. And that's and where I want my wizard to be stood to be impactful. And I just work that out, basically. And also choice of first or second makes a difference. Because if you're going first, you're going to be further up the table. If you're going second, you yeah, might true. be further back. So it, it depends. No, that's a good point. It's how I play my uh, my gits with the Loon Shrine. It uh, mm-hmm. has very similar rules. I can bring back models within nine inches. So, you know, you don't want to be too far away that, you know, when you do bring something back, they're not getting involved in the game or they're not going to be able to help deny an objective. But at the same time, you want to think about making sure that opponent isn't going to be able to sit um, within that radius and then deny you from summoning altogether. So it's a it's an interesting balance. Do you actually want to talk list now? We can. We probably <laughs> should. Hey, uh, no, this uh, has been helpful. I think. I think again, like you know, normally we wouldn't talk nearly as long about the allegiance and some of this stuff. But given the that how different Hedonites of Slanesh has changed from book one to book two, I think it was important to start thinking about how you are building, considering, looking at these rules to to I guess move it to a twenty twenty one list not mm. a old book or an old list that you're just trying to cram into the new rules which isn't quite working yeah exactly and um uh, my my list um hey mitch oh wow good to see you um so um lurid hayes um i've sort of mentioned it already that's where i lean all my lists to um there's a couple of reasons why so billowing miss having a way to take d3 units and then set them up as ambushes it does so much to your opponent in terms of um deployment gets in their headspace um it's powerful in itself because it gives you a way to protect key units if you're playing against an alpha army because you can put them off the table um none of the others give you this and i just think this is worth being in i'd love invaders anyway um, there's some artifacts in there that I love uh, that I really want, and basically the uh, Rod of Misrule being the key one. Um, so for me, like this, this ability is great, especially if you're running Sigvold. Um, it makes him a small base footprint alpha strike option, um, and with invaders as well. If you've got your general in their territory, you get a depravity point. Um, you can have multiple generals, so you can make Sigvold a general. He can operate on his own um and he can generate your depravity on turn one um not only would he go in and kill stuff he also gives you a point for being in the territory if he dies he gives you a command point so it's so powerful in and it just leans into the list aesthetic that i want to do and, and in fact just your opponent go in 
and it's after setup so you don't have to do it so you can you can say well you know you're setting up and you can just say i can take the units off and then put them in reserve and they can come on from the board edge and they're like oh okay well I'll, I'll make sure i don't leave any gaps and they kind of spread their army out they might deploy further back they might to put stuff in the corners that want to be further up um and then you just don't take anything off the table and go well cool you know it, doesn't, well, it, rem- it already has it an rem- impact it reminds me of the old zilfin rules the old barrack zilfin from carriage and overlords where it used to allow you to redeploy and you could use the psychology to go right i'm going to do this 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 and this and then just before the battle starts completely redeploy and you know you might bait somebody to to put more of their units on one side of the board or maybe you know castle up but actually then you're like no i'm going to put it over here and um completely throw your opponent off but being only d3 units though um you know you really want to be thinking about what's that one unit that i really want to to do if i'm going to do it and then what are the two optional ones if i'm lucky to get that role yeah and um for me it's sigvold is is the obvious number one and then number two is keeper or mask or um you know uh both <laughs> um and, have written and, a lot of lists with Celesque as well which helps but where you can run the keeper Celesque and sigvold but you've got to be careful not to be too aggressive as well because the keep is quite key in your army maybe maybe just the question that um maybe because it might not be obvious to everybody why why is it that those units you chose out of all the units would be the ones that you'd likely do as a reset up um well sigvold doesn't need help from anyone um he also gets a bonus to his charge so he can get closer the keeper of secrets can make sigvold go twice um so he can even if he doesn't make the charge if sigvold's holding within 12 you can use a command point to fight twice um in lurid haze you've got intoxicating pal command ability which allows you to boost an armor save so you can get sigvold to a two plus save um so it again allows you to be aggressive, um, pin them, um, and gets points. Um, he can be quite nasty on the charge. If you're making that charge, he's going to have quite a lot of attacks. So um, he ignores after saves. He he's great. I've, I really rate Sigvold. Uh, the more I've I've written lists, the more I've played or thought about playing with it. He's he is so good um, because he gives you a an answer to something that nothing else in your army could do, and that's. That's why I like him. I mean, the model's awesome anyway, so you're trying to find a reason to use it. Um, the mask is just disruptive. Like, it's just, she she is great. She can be defensive. She can, you know, she's quite hard to get to. Get to. She's also a general. I mean, her, I probably wouldn't be putting her in their deployment, like, in amongst their models. I might just have it on the edge of the table somewhere. Like, so she's just in their territory, but far away if there's a space for her and she's fast enough to get him to be impactful she's a bit of a bit of a problem piece they have to deal with it also gives you a summoning point in there like off the side of their army because what you can do if you're lucky enough to get um, a decent amount of depravity early again you can then summon around the sides around the edges and until so people are going to want to deal with her because like if you don't kill her she can just run out of combat, summon something. You know, it could be twenty demonettes like in your backfield um, on your home objective. So I think what it does, it stops people being like super aggressive into your army. Um, and I think with Sunesh now, you want to be patient. And I think that's and if you, especially if you've got any sort of shooting, it you could get your depravity ticking. Um, so I think it just gives you a ton of options like that you just don't have if you don't have the rule. So. Um, that's actually that's a really good that, that's that's a really good combination there uh, just just calling this out because the um the billowing mists uh let you set up uh on your first turn or your first movement phase at the end of your first movement phase mm. but then simultaneously then when you summon for using your depravity um it's coming off in the movement as phase so you first turn you're not gonna have a lot of su- d- depravity mm. i imagine um but having maybe play go first and then if you <laughs> that's what i was gonna to say if you it's- if you yeah, if you play mm-hmm. for the double turn or if you happen to go second and then um, generate some depravity, you, you, yeah, you're right. That's a, a threat that you just can't ignore, um, especially if you could throw in for six six depravity points, you know, five Seekers, ten Demonettes, um, or a, a Seeker Chariot. So quite... I think, quite I think it's more for, like, you're not going to get it on the turn she comes up. 
but you can put her in a place that's quite awkward for them to get to, or they have to commit a resource to a place on the table they don't want to go. And she's fast enough to get where she needs to be, but for them to get to her, they're, they're probably hurting their overall play, and they, she's still yeah. quite tough to kill. So, organize, uh, ignore her at your peril because she could do things. If you if you do go for her, cool. It means everything else in my army is mm. is um, has one less unit or one less threat is focusing on the keeper Glutos and Sigvold. Yeah. Um, so you, so we've mentioned that you've got Lured Hayes Invader Host. So this is coming from the Wrath of the Ever Chosen, and um, you've got what six six different sub allegiances to choose from. Mm. Um, now in this list, I'll read it out for the people on the podcast who might not be able to see it, and then I, I really want to unpick some of the decisions that you've made. Um, you know, first off, I can see Chaos huh? Warriors. You know, I want to know <laughs> why Chaos Warriors, not Demonettes, because um, some people here who don't want to dip into Chaos Warriors are going to go. Well, well, how do I make this pure Hedonites of Slanesh without tapping into the other side? Um, so what have you got? You've got your Keeper of Secrets, which has got the Sinister Hand. You've got the Oil of um, ex- trying Exaltation. To, the oil. Yep, I'm trying to squint on my little monitor. And then you've got the Spell of Born of, Born of Damnation. You've got your Shard Speaker, which is the General. Um, it's got the Feverish Anticipation Command Trait, the Rod of Misrule, and the Law of Pleasure and Pain, Dark Delusion. You've got Sigvold or Siggy, um, who's also the General, so I'm sure people are going to know how on earth have you got two Generals, but I'll get you to explain that. Five Chaos Warriors, five Chaos Warriors, five Chaos Warriors, all with hand, weapon, and shield. Uh, five, two units of five Slick Blade Seekers. Um, two units of allies of the Untamed Beast. You've got yourself a Soul Grinder. I'm sure lots of people don't even know what that is. Um, and then you've got the Seeker Cavalcade, as, lo- as well as the Endless Spell of the Mesmerizing Mirror. Coming in at 1720, so maybe even getting a Triumph. That's, a, that's an interesting, interesting build. So... Talk to me through like cr- the craziness. How does this all come together? <laughs> this list is a bit. It, I, I think we were going down rabbit holes. Um, so, firstly, the keeper. Obviously, you got the oil, which is the artifact you have to take. Gives you plus one wound. It's not bad. The spell born of damnation is the not the greater demon spell. It's the other demon spell, which allows you to heal non-demon units. So you can heal Sigvold with it, which is why it's there. So it's D three rather than D three or D six. But you can heal any Sinesh hero with that. So it's it's not restricted to demon. Um, but that's six inch range, right? That's quite a short. So does that mean yeah. that the keepers almost like tag teaming with Siggy? Yeah, I mean you can heal yourself, but if you're t- if you do the tag team where you put Siggy and the keeper off, Siggy makes the charge. If the keeper makes the charge as well, you know, you can then locus, fight, fight twice on Siggy, push that out. Then you've got the ability. Then, if Siggy then takes some damage, you can then heal him. It, it, it's just, I just think out of the other spells, it's just, it's okay. Like, it's, I just don't think their spells are that good, honestly. Um, and it's a casting value of four. Yeah. Four. Yeah. I'd much rather have that than the other one. So it's, yeah. um, it's, um, Shard Speaker, I really rate. Um, the trait is reroll runs, which, can be important in this list um, to do with the Slick Blades and the Seeker Cavalcade, um, which allows you to pile in six inches and fight. So you'd run rather than charge. You'd move and run with a reroll. So that's almost like if you set up with those two units within range of that, you're getting double two free command points, technically. Um, you Obviously, the Shard Speaker allows you to ping a unit at the end of the shooting phase um, with the debuff. The spell is quite good as well. Um, and Dark Delusions is again a buff, so it's a, a spell that allows you to get plus one to hit. Um, it works on shooting attacks as well. Uh, it's only 18 inch range, but it's pretty good. I really rate the Shard Speaker. I'm a little bit pricey at 150, but I do rate it. Um, obviously, why? Sigvold. Why? Why? Why do you? Why do you rate her? Uh, it just gives you it gives you a way to make your units more effective. Like you, it's a hero anyway. But then you've got. Let me just double check my my knowledge off the fly but that's right i'm pulling up um, (laughs) i'm there going "Mm, i I do know what it does but at the same time i've I've, I've been known to make slight errors so i'll just make sure so basically uh in your shooting phase you can pick an enemy unit within nine 
and on a free up add one to wound rolls that target in the combat phase so that's a, a wound buff is quite rare in age of sigmar mm. so quite like that and the spell um which is on a six pick an enemy unit with 12 uh subtract one from wound rolls that that unit makes so again it makes your armies more diffuse more defensive um and that can make quite a big difference if that's you know you're there you've got a unit it needs to survive because you want to get to gravity so you want to keep it alive so if that minus one to wound keeps you alive then it's worth and because the um twisted mirror is in the shooting phase you can move and run and use it and because you've got the command trait you get to re-roll that run so you could potentially move 12 inches and then ping nine so you could go to 21 inch range on that debuff if you get lucky um so like it can be quite impactful especially if you then you do that on a unit that you'll combo it up with slick blades and the keeper if you deploy the keeper in your home base with the slick blades which is the other where you'd use the keeper of secrets um and then obviously it, i just for he's a general as well so in lurid haze he's not going to be near your because if you if you've got two generals within 12 they can't use command abilities so the reason the keeper of secrets is not a general is because you don't want to be switch off the command ability whereas the shard speaker and sigvold probably don't need to use command abilities sigvold probably wants the plus one save but he's not going to be anywhere near the shard speaker if you're ambushing him so you're not bothered and if the keeper's near him it's not going to do anything because he's not a general so you can still use the command ability. So you've got to be really careful in invaders when you pick your generals yeah because if you if you if you're using born uh born of damnation and getting close to sigvold to do any healing you're then at the risk of turning off the command ability but um the only call out i'd probably make is that the shard speaker you know has quite short range stuff you know the twisted mirror is only nine yeah. inches even the spell is 12, so I think you've got to be really careful on protecting. Yeah, and this. Dark Delusions is 18, but that's why I would use the Fane as a platform to to move behind then come out for the next turn. Um, mm. the, the Also, the because the 9-inch range is, is short, but you get to move and run and then do it, so it, you've got to add that on to the range technically. Um, but yeah, it is short range, but at the same time, it's movement 6. You can use your Fane as a platform. Um, and the other, the artifact rod of misrule is is just a command point generation. So on a one, your opponent gets one. Obviously, you don't really want that, but what can you do? Um, two to five, you get one. On a six, you get D three. So um, command points are super important in the army. Um, I think you know that's why we've got the seeker cavalcade as well because that gives us a command point. Um, you could mess around with some of the stuff in the list, which I'll get to uh, as we talk through it. Um, Sigvold's a general as well. And also, like because they're generals in Invaders, if they die, they give you a command point. So if someone kills what your general for the first time, so if, when Shardspeaker dies for the first time or Sigvold dies for the first time, you get command points. So you get a resource even if they die, which is useful. So for me, it's like I'm kind of happy-ish when if they've got their value. So if Sigvold goes in, generates a load of depravity, kills a few things, disruptive for one or two turns, dies. I've got my value. I'm happy with that because it affected their deployment. He killed something or he didn't. Uh, he did generate depravity. I don't imagine the turn he goes in, he's going to die because he's so defensive. Um, so, yeah. And, and, I, and I, was actually, I actually really want to talk to you about Sigvold because Sigvold and uh, Glutas are the two big new heroes um, and Glutas mm -hmm. might come in a later list, but you've got Sigvold here, right? And, like, I'm looking at the War Scroll. He's got, he's got a good profile. It's quite consistent, you know. Like it's it's um, a, a series of attacks, hitting on twos, wounding on threes, ren two for D3. Um, you know, wounds inflicted by the attacks can't be negated. Um, he's going to fight first if he charges, gets plus three to his charge roll. And, um, you know, like there's some cool stuff that's coming off this. What have you learned from playing with Sigvold? Um, you mentioned already that he's super defensive. Um, and when I initially look, he's got an armor save of three. He's got six wounds. I'm like, okay, he's all right. But what's making him defensive and, and what are you learning along the way? It's the plus one save from um, the command ability from the, you know, um, invaders lord hayes but um without that um and you know he can be a bit squishy but the point is is he can heal him i think if you if you've got the healing and, and the idea is if the keeper and him ambush and get in 
your key goes first, then the keeper goes, and you've probably locust, and then the keeper can make him go again. And even if there's nothing within three, because you've charged, you can still pile in. Um, so you, and you don't need to spend that command point if there's no option to use an attack profile, but you can pretty much kill what you need to kill. Um, I just think he's disruptive. And like your, your opponent has to commit more resources than they expect to kill him. I think the problem is people go, oh, he's only got six wounds. I'll just kill him. And you're like, actually, he's a small base. You can even use, do like funky stuff like have a unit near him that, that screens his base. So you can't get many in there. And as a small footprint, he delivers a lot of damage. I like the fact he gets around after saves. You know, if you've got like a unit of witch elves with a five up, you know, re-rollable, whatever. Phoenix Guard, Fire care. Slayers. And he's like... got Rend. And you're just like, wow, his, his output is crazy. And if he's on the corner and you've used like your, you know, even like Chaos Warriors just to like me, they can't pile in around him or you've used a Locust to stop it, then, I mean, you've only got the Keeper in this list for Locust. And it's there's there's a lot of stuff when you write lists, you're like, oh, do I take this or do I take that or do I lean in? So originally, like, I didn't have like Untamed Beast, for example. I didn't have the Mirror. And then the the Battle Line were, and I didn't have the Soul Grinder, which people will probably raise eyebrows at, but the Battle Line would be like Archers and Hellstriders. Um, and then they go into the Seeker Cavalcade. That makes your army lower drop. So does that matter? Why have I got Untamed Beast? So it's like all these decisions. You can go around the circles and there's no right answer. It's almost like I find that I I write so many lists because I can never find that. I don't get a list and go, that's the list, and I can't move away from it. Some books I do. I get to a list and I go, there's no, I wouldn't do anything. This is the best list I can write. And, and spoiler, I, I asked Russ for two lists. He gave me four and told me he wrote 30. So um, <laughs> it just shows you, it just shows you, and this is Cities of Sigma. This is the, the rabbit hole of, you know, you're like, oh, what if I do this? Oh, but then this synergizes with this and you just go in this complete rabbit hole. And I think that yeah. as a, a list building, I can live in Cities of Sigma for years and years because it's just constantly evolving. I can handle the meta. Um, and I, I, I'll probably be remiss as well to mention, not mention that he has a four up, um, feel no pain on yeah. wounds and mortal wounds. So not only can you bring his three up to a two up, then roll re-roll ones if you want to throw another command point down. Then you've got the four up um, after save, so that's and then you can heal him as well. So it just mm. becomes this super durable. Is it like Nagash where you just ignore him and just let him do his thing and you focus Please. on everything else, yeah, or do you? No, no, but, 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 but you ask <laughs> yeah. a really like if I throw all of my resources at Sigvold and I don't do much, and then you just heal it. It's like, do I do that again? And the opponent starts asking really tough questions and. And it's those questions that can force a mistake. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to ignore Sigvold. And you're like, yes, I'm now going to do this. But if then they're just putting all of their resources into Sigvold, you're like, cool, I've now got a keeper. I've got all this stuff that's now going to score objectives, take mm. out, you know, supporting heroes. And he, he's going to give you a turn one to property generation. If you if he's in the territory, you're getting a point. If he's, if he's hurt, you should take a wound or two. Great, that's another point. If he's done some damage, it's another point. You're you you're generating two free depravity. You straight away you're in you're into winning territory with that because it's just and then if they kill him, you get a command point. So even if he goes in, kills one thing, does a bit of damage, they hurt him, they kill him the next turn, you still generated one, two depravity on turn one, and maybe another two on the next turn, and and you know, you're you four depravity and a command point down, up and you're one of their units down if you lost a two sixty point hero, and you're like, fine, you know, I'll take that. So uh, and as Learn Train Play has also said, I'm going to bring this up. Um, I would laugh if Seagull got hand of dusted. And I'm just looking at his rules. There's nothing to stop him from being hand of no. dusted by the looks of it. I mean, if you're um, charging into Nagash, and he could, I mean, he, he could do a number on him if you've rolled a 12 inch charge or something. But I, yeah, if you charge him into Nagash and Nagash is hands of dusted, and then he hands of dusted, but you know, you don't charge him. It's a Nagash good trade. You don't want to be hand It's a good trade. It's a good trade. It's a good trade. You got, I think I'd be scared got, as an Agash player. I would be scared if he went oh, in yeah. with 12 attacks. Like, D3 damage with Rend, ignore it after save. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you got three units of five Chaos Warriors. So if I hadn't looked at Slaves to Darkness and I've stuck to this battle tome, I guess twofold. One, 
why Chaos Warriors? You talked earlier about them just being a little bit cheaper than some of the other units you would normally select. Um, but I guess how do the three Chaos Warrior units come into play here? So you, you want depravity, right? And you need units to stick around and set up objectives. So Chaos Warriors, you've got 10 wounds. They've got a four up armor save. They've got a, a mortal wound save of a five up. Um, so actually they're they're tougher to crack than like a unit of demonettes. You know, demonettes will die easier. You want them to survive because that gives you depravity. Um, you're they're not there for damage, you don't care about your fruit killers. They're the cheapest. Um, honestly, points are so tight, you're like, I'll just have more points, please. Um, so they are. I mean, I like Hell Striders a lot, especially in um Seeker Cavalcade. Because you can generate depravity with them, especially if you're you just run up, pile in. If you've got the three inch reach whips, that you have very little damage coming back to you. You'll do a couple of wounds. They'll pile in, do a couple of wounds. That's two more depravity. So I do like those, but you are paying an extra sixty points per unit. So that's one hundred and eighty points. So trying to find one hundred and eighty points in the list is quite tough. Like I, I just it is a tough thing to do. Yeah, for sure. The soul grinder could be dropped. You could have two units of five hell striders with scourges and eleven archers. You probably then wouldn't be able to get a triumph. You probably then wouldn't. So it's all these considerations. I like chaos warriors. I probably use the painbringer models with a slight conversion um, and just say, well, they're my chaos warrior units. And mm -hmm. you know, it's it's up to your taste. But for me, I want a unit that can stick around. Um, you know, the after save is also optional. So if you want to, you could take like a end spell bid? ping damage. Well, you can you can basically say like because the the five up mortal wound save from the shield is optional. So if you want to hurt them with an endless spell, like if you want to ping like I don't know a, a mortal wound on each one, you don't have to take the five up. So you don't have to take the save. So you could just get the get the wound done because as you can. So. um they're quite good for that. I just think out of the battle line, if you want something just to be resilient, they're probably the best thing you can pick for the points. So that's why they're there. You know, then it makes perfect sense. You know, having multiple wounds, having um, the potential of having an after save, uh, and being cheaper, you know, being 20 points cheaper than demonettes, you know, which would be your traditional battle line. That's 60 points. That could be difference between that endless spell being in there or not. Um, mm -hmm. That could allow you to have a battalion where normally you couldn't. So I think that's a um, finding where you could. Um, find find value and then it unlocks things like your you know the untamed untamed beast so i like i like the chaos warriors um your slick blades are obviously going to tie into the seeker cavalcade um yeah so they're the damage they're the melee damage um they've got the added bonus of having a two inch reach so if your keepers in your army um you can obviously run your keeper in charge they they follow up they run up next to him within six of the enemy unit you roll your locus it goes off great it doesn't go off okay so you fight with your keeper um the slick blades then are in a position that what they can do is basically pile in an attack two inches away and then the keeper can even make them go again um so they're just they're just really good i, I think i think you get 20 wounds they're fast they're quite good in combat they do the mortals um I like the fact they don't have a charge bonus, so you don't feel like you're gimping yourself by using the Seeker Cavalcade for the six inch pile in. You're kind of just going, well, they're gonna do what they do. Um, I like the models, so that's my that's my when you write a list, you normally have like four hundred points of damage that you have of combat unit, and that could be six fiends, it could be Chaos Knights, it could be slick blades, it could be, you know, whatever. Could be a unit of ten twin souls whatever you want to have i mean what's up to you personally because i want the seeker cavalcade the other option is you can change the seeker cavalcade out for a different formation and then you could run a different thing um <clears throat> i i think for 200 points they're, they're pretty good I would, I would run them yeah no so. i dig it i I dig it. I haven't had a, I haven't had a chance to play. I, I love the slick blade models. I just haven't had a chance to play against them. Um, but and the, and obviously the cavalcade allowing you to pile in an additional three inches. Yeah. Um, and you know just 
allowed you to do some very cool things. Um, and I think, I think there's not a lot of, th- uh, there's not a lot of ways to do a six inch pile in, in the game. Um, mm-hmm. but when you start to play with that mechanic, you realize how valuable it can truly be. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's so good in Sinesh because you're going to hit whatever you're going to hit. That means if you don't kill them, you get depravity. And then when they come back at you, they're going to be weaker. So you could put two different units. The two slip blades can run up next to them. They can't fight you. You get to fight with both your units before they go. And which is powerful in itself. If you don't wipe these units out, that's depravity. If they attack you back, they're probably depleted. So they're probably not going to kill you either. So that's another depravity. That's four depravity. Like you've just generated. Plus you're still there. So it's like they're pinned. So like for me, like the, the seeker cavalcade allows you to get to private and i actually this list my original list doesn't have the chaos warriors it has one unit and two use the hell striders it doesn't have the untamed beasts um and it's got um and that basically is more in line with the seeker cavalcade because you get the same effect on the hell striders you get lower drops um and the only reason i put the untamed beasts in this list is because <clears throat> they are a great way of pushing the enemy back from an alpha strike. So you get to do a pre-game move. You could use Ungor Raiders. So you've got the points. They could be Ungor Raiders, do the same thing, but they shoot. So there might be a better choice. Um, I only just put those in because I prefer the models. Um, do what you want. Like if you want to put two units of, of Ungor Raiders, that's probably a better choice in bunny quotes. Is there any reason, um, and I, I want to call out one more comment on the Slick Blade, but I want to close yeah. this um, Untamed Beast out. Is there any reason, now that you've kind of identified that the Ungors might be probably better because of the shooting, is there a thing that maybe the Untamed be- Beasts bring to the table that maybe um, the Ungors might not? Not really. <laughs> Just Much of a march. They've got one shooting attack, so you could still get a depravity point. Um, no, they're not. I mean, to be honest, they're much of a muchness. Uh, I, I haven't really. They're not really there to do anything other than just to push the enemy back and maybe do a cheeky wound. Um, so yeah, I mean, Ungors might be a better choice. They probably are the better choice, but it's 10, 20 more points you got to spend. So well, well, the chat can tell me later what they like. Do they prefer Untamed Beasts or they feel they like the Ungor Raiders? I just don't think there's enough in it to to matter, honestly. Hey, hey, hey! Don't 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 ruin my engagement here. Uh, leave it in the comment <laughs> section below. No, I didn't mean it. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, but, one thing, but, but one thing I do want to call out on the sli- uh, the slick blade uh, seekers as well is um, obviously the ability to reroll the charges, could be really powerful. Yeah. Um, and in addition, um, those wound rolls of six for the glaives doing a mortal wound as well. So you know, even mm. just guaranteeing yourself that cheeky mortal um, can be enough to generate the depravity. Yeah, and I just think they out of the combat units you've got available, they're not as defensive as some of the others, but because you've got Seeker Cavalcade, you can get around that. So, you know. Yeah, B4 wounds, there. they're quite tasty. And, and a 14-inch oh, yeah. move. 14-inch move is yeah, massive. Massive. And then the 6-inch pile-in, so. Yeah, and then you've got a re-rollable um, run roll if they're near the Shard Speaker when they start their move. So it's... Uh, you could move 20 inches pile in six. So you could be there turn one. Talk to me about this soul grinder. I haven't played a right. soul grinder since oh. AOS one. Uh, and when my free people at CanCon, my, my empire free guild guard pulled down a soul grinder and Archeon in the same game. But talk to me about this soul grinder right. because I have seen some people test the soul grinder, but I haven't seen it on the table very often. Um, so what secret source have you unlocked? I'm going to have to credit Byron because right. it might have been the sun getting to us um, that, you know, affecting our brains. We don't get a lot in the UK. So having a little bit of sunshine, sat out feeling good, soul grinder starts to look better than it actually is. You know, it's the uh, rose tinted goggles, <laughs> I guess. I And I joked to Byron, I said, the fact that everything in the Sinesh book is so bad, it looks great. But I was just kidding. <laughs> No, 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 so, no, 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 no. Uh, like, um, like, like in the old Slanesh book, one of my friends um, and someone who's been playing uh, slave, uh, slaves, uh, Slanesh for a long time, who might do another episode with me on this topic, he was running one to three soul grinders. I know he was testing that out with Slanesh. I think it was with um, the old Celeste, um, uh mm. host. 
Yeah. And, you know, when I, when I look at this profile, you know, 16 wounds, it has, you know, a, a range 20 attack. It's got a bunch of two-inch attacks. Um, like, like, what does this thing do? Why are you taking it for 200 points? Well, it shoots, um, and it can run and shoot, and it moves 12 and can run and shoot, and it's got a 20-inch and a 60-inch range. Um, so you can generate depravity with it. It's also on a massive base, so it's on a Archeon base. What? It's like a 160, which, like it's, it's massive. It is 160, it's huge, which is, I know it sounds silly, but that is a big area that you could just deny area of the table. Like if someone's got ambushes or stuff, you just plonk that pie plate down. You're like, well, you're not going anywhere near there. And it's fast enough with a shooting attack to be impactful, even if you deploy it in the back corner, because it can run and shoot. Um, mm. Again, if it's near the shard speak, you get to reroll the run, um, and it generates. It can generate depravity at range, which is great. It's also um, it's okay in combat. The reach is important, um, and you also get the claw that if you roll a uh, a six on the hit roll, it does d six mortal wounds. Mm. So, you know, people rate about Taragais. I mean, you know, you, and it's not got... it's not amazing, but. But you've got a lot of Ren 2 attacks here. Um, and I think as well, the fact that you can market Slanesh, so, yeah, Slanesh, you can obviously market Corn, Nurgle, Zench, um, Slanesh or Undivided. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you can um, you can market as well just means that it, it's synergizing quite nicely. So It's also a monster. So some scenarios, <laughs> monsters, you know, um, it's got 16 wins and a four up save. If you use the unit of Bliss Barb Archers, that's 180 points. And um, they might have slightly better shooting, they're worse in combat, but they've got a five up save. So for me, it's like, or you could take the the core Bliss Barb Archers. They're not they're not as long range threat from move, run, and shoot. So I again, like it's to taste, right? It's in there for me because I wanted a I, I just thought it'd be a cool model. You could convert out of a big spider, put a demon body on top, like a keeper body, put big crab claws, make a big crab, whatever, it's cool. Um it, I'm not saying like it's gonna be I think again, much of a muchness do it to taste. If you want to run Bliss Barb Arches, run Bliss Barb Arches. But for me, I just thought it was quite a, an interesting topic to talk about, which is why I put it in the list, because I think that yeah. it's an overlooked thing. Um, and, and, and you know, like actually it, when you get into the detail, it's good. And at the end of the day, you know, that, you know, th that's the whole point of this show is, you know, just share some ideas. Uh, if you don't like the soul grinder, you know, for the similar type of points, you get yourself a, a blade bringer herald on the hill flyer, or you get yourself, you know, a, a herald on the seeker chariot. You get yourself a contorted epitome. You could get yourself um, Celeste. You could get. There's so many things you get with 200 points. So yeah, I think you, want to you need some shooting. So, like, what you could do is, like, drop the Soul Grinder out, put in... I, I run a list with Celeste in it, um, and the Mirrors, instead of the Mes... Well, not the Mesmerize Mirrors, the Umbral Spell Portal. And then, because I want to put Stupefy and Subvert through the Mirror with Hysterical Frenzy, optionally. Um, and that's what I ran at the ETC, and it's a command point shut-off. So if you're playing against someone who's got a particularly impactful command point model, you can stop them doing it, or, or even running and charging with Stupefy. Um it's just not very reliable to cast from the the wizard but um yeah i mean i like the soul grinder it's good um R wrapping it up you've got your mesmerizing mirror and mm. um and you got 30 points that's so a triumph um what's the mirror doing for you um i don't know yet i just i'm i'm fancy trying it so um it's um and and like that could be geminids that could be cogs that could be Cogs is good, for obviously, because it gives okay. you a chance to get your charges in on the first alpha. It could. It's be almost everything alpha except alpha. for, like, it's it, literally almost everything except for bridge, because bridge is a hundred. Like, other than got, that, like, yeah. it's it's literally yeah. like, like it's it's sixty points for mirror. You got thirty points additionally because yeah. you haven't spent it, so you got up to ninety points to get yourself, as you said, cogs, Bailwind vortex, like literally whatever. That, that stuff is whatever you want. The reason I like the mirror is I. I just want to try it out, honestly. Um, so what I quite like about this is that it's as if he, if basically you set it up with an 18, um, it's predatory, and it's as if a, a unit makes a normal move within 12, it takes D3 mortals unless it finishes closer to the model than it was before this was made. It doesn't affect Sanesh. 
So, um, and then obviously you've got the gaze into the depths, which can be quite <laughs> spiky on heroes, depending on how many sixes you roll. Um, I've had that. I've had an opponent play them play that at me once with my hallow, my hallow heart, and I was shitting myself because I got all these little five wound heroes around my hurricanum. But you know, like, and obviously they're only five wounds, so if they if they get spiked, they die. And that's an interesting mechanic, right? You know, after you set it up, um, you roll six dice for each hero within six. For each six, the hero suffers. Uh, it's a mortal wound to the equivalent of how many sixes. So if you roll one six, it's one mortal wound. If you roll two sixes, it's four mortal wounds. If you roll three sixes, it's nine mortal wounds. No. Um, so those spikes are just crazy. Top four sixes. Like, I was really lucky to be Hallow Heart and I ignored the endless look. spell. <laughs> I, endlo- I ignored the endless spell on a yeah. four or a five. But, yeah, like you could just like pop pop a whole bunch of little supporting Just characters. one shot Archeon <laughs> if you got jammy. Like, I've rolled five sixes. He's dead. Um, and... And this is like also what's really good is that um, you depravity. Okay, so a lot of people will go, "Oh, I don't care about taking a couple mortal wounds. I'm just going to move where I want to and then attack you." But if they ping a couple wounds on a load of units, that's loads of depravity you just got. So it's another level of control plus resource generation that isn't tied into shooting. So that uh, the, and also it doesn't affect you. It can't affect your units. It can't hurt you. So where Geminids might people might think they're better, you don't really yeah. want to be minus one to hit or minus one to you know minus one attack yeah, this, or you know. So this, this ability actually, has no no effect on Slanesh, So you're you're yeah. protected, and it gives you a way to kill a super character. And even if it's unlikely, your opponent has to think that's a must stop. I have to stop that spell. I just cannot let that go off because if it goes off, that potentially could one shot my hero even if it's a six seven wound hero could, could one shot them and and like or at least do enough to to kill it and you think actually i can't i can't let that go off um no it's i i personally like it it's a little bit short ranged um but if you if you've managed to ambush your keeper and he's there the next turn and you pop that mirror in the middle of their army behind it they're going to be like well i have to move forwards because i want to win the game but by moving forwards i'm just going to generate you a shitload of depravity so no, I like it. I like it. As a Gits player who is all about spikes and, you know, troughs and, and diamonds, it's like uh, I could do a million damage or I could do nothing. And the <laughs> opponent always like, hmm, I don't I don't want to handle that million. So Plus, I'll just fun, let right? you do it. <laughs> like it's fun rolling those six dice and just hoping for Yahtzee. You know, I mean, like I find that I get a kick out of that. So it's a bit like the old um, Curse of the Years with Ark and the Black when it was like, can I can I go down to one and one shot a unit in the old days? You know, it was, it was fun. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, while Russ has a sip of water, I'll talk through list number two. So there'll be some commonalities. So I know we went quite deep and I, I did that purposely. So because there's some consistency, but then there's going to be some differences. So list number two. Um, what you, what have you got again with, with, with Lewis Hayes? Why why not swap into any other? Before we get into that, like why why not any other of the hosts? Like why are you kept going Lewis Hayes? Um, because all all of these lists are around the Sigvold ambush, so it, you need it. Cool. Um, um, I have written Pretenders lists. Um, I have written because Pretenders um, they have some good stuff. Um, I think Godseekers with plus one to charge is underrated um, because, you know, that helps your summoning impact. You're on an eight with a reroll, so a nine with a reroll, it's a big difference. Um, also means you're more likely to get in. You can't fail charges from three away. So Godseekers has got the Cameo of the Dark Prince, which which goes really well with, with your Artifact Burn with the Fane. So it's not like the others aren't viable. It's just I like Lurid Hayes, so that's where I'm leaning. I, I don't know... As I play more games, um, I might decide to move away from that strategy. I don't know. Like I haven't played enough to to, to know, so I'm just sticking with my initial uh, thoughts. And as I get into the games more, I might swap it. But like for all the reasons I said, you know, plus one armor save. You get the the, the command point generation when your generals die. You get the ambush. You get the plus one wound artifacts. Not terrible. The reroll runs is pretty good. It's command point efficient. Um, and then you've also got the access to the Rod of Misrule for command point generation. So for me, it's command points are king. So that's where it is. 
And the great thing as well is, you know, if you like pretenders, if you like the invaders, if you like the god seekers, you can take the theory that we've kind of talked about depravity generation, locus, talk about some of the, the strategies that Russ has already spoken about. It's like, cool, well, then how does that apply to pretenders, god seekers, um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, so list number two, you have the Keeper of Secrets. It looks like the same combo. Um, you've got yourself the oil and you've got yourself the spell of damnation. Yeah. Um, you've got Siggy again. Um, Sigvold is the general. Um, you've got yourself a mask instead. You've got the mask instead of the shard speaker. Uh, and you've also got a chaos sorcerer lord who's also the general. You've got three generals. Um, you've got the command trait of feverish anticipation. You've got the artifact of Rod of, Rod of Misrule again, uh, and the spell combination of dark delusion. So I'm curious to see how that c compares to was it the shard speaker that had the same combination? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Kazro is still the same. You got the Untamed the Beast. Yeah. Uh, it's the same. He's got the same loadout, basically. So, yeah. So, like, when, when, we, when we get to it, I want to see, I want to hear from you what the Sorcerer Lord with the same combination is doing compared mm -hmm. to the Shard Speaker. Um, you got yourself 10 Chaos Knights. You got, you, you, you've kept your Soul Grinder. We've swapped the battalion out to be Supreme Sabarites and you've kept your Mirror. So, how does this one differ? So essentially it's almost the same. Um, what you're what you're doing is you're swapping out your combat unit of slick blades to 10 chaos knights. Um, they don't I don't think this is stronger. I, I think this is maybe weaker, but I don't know. I think it's more defensive. So I think the chaos knights have got more lasting power because the chaos sorcerer lord, you can put oracular visions to give him a rerollable save. And you can give them a free plus save with the command trait from Lurid Haze because it's not, it doesn't say Head Knight, it's just a Lurid Haze invader unit. So you could have a free up rerollable armor save. You also get demonic power. So you could demonic power the knights and then you could use that rerollable save on a unit of Chaos Warriors. Um, so the Chaos Sorcerer Lord buffs those two units very effectively. Um, it allows you to get a mask. Um, as you save 80 points there. Um, you save 40 points from the Shard Speaker. Um, that allows you to put the mask in. And the mask, as I spoke about earlier, is a great option to run solo. It also means when the mask dies, you get a command point again. Gives you another summoning point. Um, and Supreme Cyberites is the hero formation. So you roll a dice, and if you roll... Uh, it's, it's, it's ender or it's, so basically if you roll a free up you'll get a command point if you've got all four heroes um so basically it's a command point generating battalion because you don't need seek a cavalcade because you've migrated away from the slick blades um the soul grinders there for the reasons for the shooting um and essentially it's almost the same list and it was just it was just to show the flexibility around little changes that can completely redesign what you're doing. And and for me, I've still got the elements of the core. I've got the untamed beast for the pushback. I've still got the combo with Sigvold, the keeper. Uh the, the Chaos Sorcerer is still a summoning point, still a general. He's still got the he's still got the rod of misrule. He's still got the reroll run. So he then buffs the knights or the warriors. Um the mask is extra. The the battalion has changed, but essentially it's much of a muchness. It's just that I've decided that rather than two fives of sick blades, I'll have ten chaos warriors. So uh, ten chaos knights, sorry. So it's uh, it's you know it's fine, and they're they're good because they are just more defensive. So if you want to, if you've got a mission where you've got to just get onto an objective and stick around, a free up re rollable unit of chaos knights is going to be quite a tough nut to crack with a five up mortal wound save particularly then if they don't kill it you get into depravity so that unit there is is grindy it's it's more it's it's they're more grindy than you expect them to be i think i, th I think probably me you know if i if i maybe um so people watching this show might be thinking this feels more like a slaves to darkness mm. marked slanesh than it feels heated nights of slanesh with you know the integration and like when i look when i look at this i think you know the reality is, is that chaos warriors are just cheaper and that allows you to do more but i, I know you know with the hundred list that you've you've shared with me you know you could swap out those chaos knights very easily to be six six fiends um yep. 
you could make some minor tweaks from those um, Chaos Warriors to be Demonettes. And we've already talked about those multiple small units of Demonettes just being better than the big blocks. So with some minor adjustments, you could definitely swing it back very easily. Um, you could drop the Chaos Sorcerer Lord and, you know, with a minor tweak, get yourself a Contorted Epitome. Um, so... So I think for me, I yeah. think this is the key, right? Like you you take what you like out of these lists and season it to taste. If you're like, um, like I know there's a guy in my Discord, War Soren, who is absolutely obsessed with his fiends. Like he loves running like six and nine fiends. Or if you want to yeah. run all the lawnmower chariots, it's like you can do it. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess with so many options between this book doubling in size between demons and mortals and then all the mark stuff that comes from slaves – this is probably a more probably the more competitive build maybe right now, but hey, there's a lot of testing that still has to happen with this book. I uh, yeah, and I, I my first, I mean, I I almost sent you uh, of a list um, intentionally, which had, and I think I wanted to discuss the warrior thing in depth, so I thought the best way to do it was just to ram them ram them into the list and just wait for the reaction, right? But um, do you, I mean, like like I say, you drop the end of spell out, then you can drop the soul grinder. And you could drop the untamed beast, and then you can change, like you say, like the warriors could be two units of slick blades, and then all your core could be all hell striders. You might need to drop one down to fit everything in you want to warriors. They're kind of that's the the thing is when you write a list, there isn't a lot of places you can find points. There are some mm -hmm. heroes you definitely want. You can't. There isn't a cheaper hero. They, they, they don't have cheap heroes. You don't have anything like subpar 100 points so like you're like where do i get my cheap hero from that i need you could use like um you can't use like a great bray because you then need a good brave grove because and that's the list i wrote which was ungor raiders and a great bray which gives you a cheap wizard do you know it gives you the formation and it gives you three units of ungor raiders that replace the untamed beast certainly viable it's not that expensive um, I just don't like the beast aesthetic in my army, so I just didn't want to paint those models. So I didn't write a list because it's in my head. It's it's about that as well. It's not just what yeah. is the most optimal thing. Um, but yeah, you could easily write a list with no slaves units in, and much of my first ones didn't have any in it. And you can, there are some lists we talked about on Facehammer that you know on our shows that don't have any slaves units in. And I just think at the moment I'm just leaning that way, and it's which way the wind blows on the day you write your Sinesh list. I mean, because it's, it, it's interesting. There's so many options. Yeah, and I, and I know, you know, some people in the chat were talking about pain bringers. They're like, oh, you know, I would love to see some pain bringers. But, you know, the reality is there are 150 points for five that, you know, Chaos Warriors might play a similar mm -hmm. role. Um, that, and I think to your point as well, if you were to use we pain can, bringers instead of Chaos Warriors. We can be Warriors, real about it, right? That they're, they're overcosted. Like you, you, you go. I want a resilient unit, so you're going to pay 270 points for 15 chaos warriors. It's 30 wounds, free rollable save, mortal wound save, or you can spend 300 points on 10 pain bringers. You get less wound, less defense, less bodies. You're a bit better in combat, but like, yeah, exactly. I mean, take like the models, use them as chaos warriors, and I'm sure if, when oh, there's some down the road when there's been games there'll be that will be looked at and that'll be the consideration of maybe chaos warriors will go up or you know the pain bringers will drop and then you'll say well actually now they're they're viable and then you just swap and then your lord of pain becomes important because he unlocks them as battle line and then your shard speaker becomes a lord of pain and then you go actually i might as well put twin souls in as my combat choice because i've got a 400 point combat slot so in my head i kind of look at it i've got this many points for combat i've got this many points for shooting i've got this many points for heroes i've got this and it, it and that becomes the thing you can rotate around and the little bits here and there you can borrow from those pots but you always want to have a screen maybe i mean i generally think you, you could get away without it if you were ballsy but it's up to you um you kind of want a formation you want a keeper definitely you want some other heroes um and i think the core you need three units, what they are, to take how much points you've got left for the play in the other areas, and you, you just play around with that. Well, I, I was actually just bringing up an old slide that I, I made up during the Heater Nights review, and I think this is part of the challenge when it comes to list teching and what do I build into my list versus what do I summon onto the table. And the reality is if I look at all this stuff on the table, most of the things went up. 
Like, and, and when you start adding multiple of these things into your list and you realize that, you know, your, your seekers went up 30 points, you know, your, um, some things were jumped up 40, 50 points. Um, where do you find those additional points? And, um, what are those trades that you need to make? And I think that was, that's the challenge. I think that's where things like Chaos Warriors become very attractive for list building because that is essentially a free 60 points that allows you to take the the the, the big damage dealers or the big um, buff pieces or the soaking engines um, because you've got the points. Allows you to do Sigvold and the combinations or, um, you know, glue toss or whatever it might be. I think you'll find with the points, like um, when you have a battle tome, the allegiance abilities get baked into the points and it's more a, a finger in the air type thing because you can't really formula it right. Um, but the thing is about the slaves units, when they were pointed, they've not they've not had any tax on the Sinesh allegiance. And because the Sinesh allegiance still works, depravity, which is the most important, still works off those units, their value maybe feels a little bit and they feel a little bit cheap for what they do in a Sinesh army as they do into like another army um so you're doubling down because you're not paying the tax but you're also still getting the benefit so i think that the reason they seem like a cheap good option is because the points when they're done it they're looking at it's looked at slaves point of view and this is the issue you've got when you've got multiple books that interact and i guess you get the same with cities like and you'll find that stuff that's a bargain or over or over costed in or costed a certain per level in stormcast loses in cities but doesn't get cheap perfect, perfect example would in my cities right is um i can take in my in my battalion for tempest i can take two gun haulers and gun haulers went from 150 to 130 because i think ko players just weren't taking gun haulers but i'm like happy days that's at the time like they just weren't that popular no, i just want to kill russ um with that statement but you're right, like you can tap into some of the, the really good value and got the twins coming, so who knows what they're going to do. Um, and, you know, probably to, to Hudson's point here, um, I personally am excited to see Chaos Warriors in list because I'm sick of seeing Marauders. I'm sick of seeing the answer always being Marauders. Hmm. And um, so for me, like, uh, I know some people <coughs> are disappointed not to see Demon Eds and Painbringers, but for me it's like, yeah, Chaos Warriors. But I love a question Chaos Warriors. Coming, Oh, they're so they're so classic. They they they're, 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 my, they're the model that that I did entire army just because of that model. I remember back in the old Hero Quest, the Chaos Warriors and the Chaos Sorcerer loved them. And for me, like well, my slaves army doesn't have marauders in it. Um, well, the uh, the yeah. irony the irony is that the Chaos Warrior was spawned <laughs> the the storm uh, the the Space Marine. So that yeah. really kicked off Games Workshop aesthetic. But question from Harlequin is. Um, do you have any feedback or any questions? And I know we haven't seen um, Shalaxi in your list, but do you have any thoughts between Keeper versus Shalaxi? Yeah. Um, Keeper's just better, in my opinion. Like, I know you probably want to be told that Shalaxi's really good. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot. I mean, the biggest thing for me is that when you, um, when you take... Um, Shalaxi is a named unique, so you can't actually give it traits or artifacts. So straight away you're losing there. Um and I yeah, I mean it's okay. I mean you've got the you've got a combat profile, it's it's okay. I mean I, I don't really look at Shalaxi, I I'm, I'm if I'm honest, in it it's just because it doesn't do anything for me. I prefer the classic keeper, but um I'm sure that it's combat. It's quite good against heroes, um, but I just like the flexibility of the keeper, and and I, I just don't know. I don't think it's uh, worth. So I'm sorry. I try to be upbeat about it, but I'm not sure. It's, uh, no, it never. I never really consider Shalaxi. That's why I had to look at the book because I'm like, I don't know what she does really. But um, off the top of my head, but no, that's that's the, that's the general feedback is that um, having and even if you took two keepers, it, that would be better than probably taking a keeper and Shalaxi in most in most cases. But yeah. Um, Cause you don't even have the command ability, do you? Which is the big thing. You lose a lot. And like, there's some cool rules, but it's just not worth the trade off. You um, probably come down another like 40 points for you to start thinking about it. I mean, 
I almost like look at her between her and Sigvold, and I think I'd rather have Sigvold. So, um, well, that that's exactly right. Like when you look at Shalaxi now, she's three ten, so a normal mm. keeper's three forty. So if you if you were like trying to get two of them in your list and you didn't have quite the points of having two, you might take Shalaxi to get on your two K. You might but to be, your yeah. point, but to your point, it might be actually better taking Sigvold, and especially in the build that you're building, getting a potentially a two up armor save, a plus three of the charge, you know, not being able to save any of his damage. It's like it almost feels like Sigvold is a better choice. And you get to look at his rear end. Um those as as chaps yeah um but i i think the um i think like shalaxi like even when you run a double keeper list now because of the change to the command ability where you can't key off yourself you can't buff yourself having two keepers allows each of them to hit each other and it gives you redundancy whereas if you lose your keeper that's a big deal um so like if you've got two you're like, well, you can kill one. I've still got another one. So one of the lists I've I've written um, was around Ep- Epicurean Revelers, I think, and it had like Seekers and Demonettes and two Keepers. Um, it's a little bit. I don't know if it's that good, but it's like it's like you lose a lot. I think you you, you start. I mean, I actually think Seekers of Sanesh are one of the most underrated, undercosted, best things in the book. So one of the lists I've written is rather than have that 400 point combat unit, that's three units of five Seekers. And because they are they fast, they can run and charge, they get to reroll charges, they they blend quite nicely, they give you depravity. If you run Seeker Cavalcade, it's one drop. If you then you can run Hell Striders as your core. It's a really it's really solid. If you run like three units of Hell Striders, three units of Seekers, you're you've got your comp you haven't got anything that's like super combat, but you don't necessarily need that. You you just it's death by a thousand cuts, which is what you want. Um, so there's super, there's, there's loads, there's so many army lists. I mean, like I, I literally, I got lost trying to narrow it down and I was just got to the point. I'm like, I'm always sending you the same list with little tweaks. And I'm like, this is all, they're almost the same, but that's why I sent you the free because it's almost a way of talking to people who are crafting lists to realize how flexible Sunesh can be. And I, and I think as well, like, um, when you're tweaking a list and you would know this Russ, you know, better than, than a lot of people is when you are tweaking a list because it's not working for you, you don't make wholesale changes. You make small changes and you test them before you start going, right, I'm going to gut literally half the army. And um, and, and, and and this kind of comes in nicely to this question, which was thoughts around three keepers. Wow. To me, this, this feels like the first battle tome. And mm. if I was someone who really wanted three keepers on the table, I would likely buy two and then try to summon the third. I don't know if I would actually go out and put buy three three keepers or two keepers and Shalaxi um, in my points allocation, but what's your thoughts? It depends. I mean, a lot of this depends on what you mean by viable. Like, can you do it at 2,000 points and can you put it on the table? Yes. Um, I believe you can. I haven't done the maths, but... I oh, yeah, it, yeah, 100%. 100%. Be, yeah, yeah, so... So yeah. yeah, so you you can you can do it and put it on the table. You might better win some games of it. Is it going to be optimal? I don't think any list that leans into one war scroll to that level is going to be that good in a varied competitive environment because you need to be adaptable to what happens in the scenarios. But it doesn't mean you can't. It doesn't mean that it couldn't do well if that's what you want. And this is the thing I say on my channel all the time, right? Like there's no right or wrong when it comes to this. And like, you can look at the stats and you go, this is slightly better than this. We're talking about some of the stuff is marginal. And like, honestly, in some situations that will be better in some situations that will be worse. When I write an army list, I always try and cover multiple things. So when I get to the table, I always feel like I can play the game. I don't want to turn up to the table and be like, I can't win this game no matter what I do. So I try to write flexible lists that allow me to do that. Is it the most powerful list in that matchup? No, because if you told a list for that opponent, you 100% could make a better list. But you don't know you're going to play that person. And then the next round, you're not playing that person. So you need to be more adaptable. Now, that doesn't mean you can't take a very one-dimensional army 
you know, and do well and enjoy it. And then that's fine. And, and you just accept it. I mean, and that's the issue I had with KO because I love the models and I love the aesthetic and I love the background. I've got a whole army that I've done and I've done cog bases and I've converted it all. And I've got it all on like warehouse, like industrial basing. And I took it to one event, I played with it and I went, this is just, I just, just trash for the other person. I don't enjoy it. I'm not, I'm not using any of the skills in warhammer with combat piling in charging anything i'm just literally plopping my pie plate down and rolling a load of shooters and either dying or winning and i just this is just dull i mean i know the army is very different now but it's still too heavy in the shooting and and the kind of the uninteractive nature of that and i think you're running the risk doing that list that you might turn up to a table and someone in can actually smash you with um all of your um you know rules and just say actually i'm i I can't actually beat this but you can definitely run it it's 100 percent something you can run so um i dig it um that's yeah like as as, is it eddie murphy's uh, is it eddie murphy or chris rock once said you can drive with your two with your two feet doesn't make it a good idea but i think it's your (laughs) Like, it's like, you know, what do you count as viable? Is it, you know, have a fun game? Can you win? Can you win? Yes. Um, can it potentially be challenging? Yes. Um, if you were going to try to win a tournament, um, is it the list that you'd want to take? Well, there would be challenges. You know, some of the scenarios, you're getting bonus points for battle line. And if you're not building a good amount of battle line, then you're really making it a, a disadvantage to win those scenarios. Now, you might get really lucky, uh, but then again, you might come up against a horde of like 160 grots, which are all battle lines. So can you beat them? Maybe not with three keepers. No. <laughs> Who knows? It's like, you know, it's... play what you love. Um, no, that's great. No, look, it's – um, and, you know, to, to Volton's um, – valentine um you know from a slanish point of view you know the i think i think for me you know the rule of cool comes in um find what you like um we've talked about a couple of lists already um i really love the glutos model i just think i love that this that 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 chariot um but at the same Mm. time you know there's so many cool models i think it's find a style find a a type of model and build around it um and too because i finally feel represented in the hobby you know, outside of more tribes. So, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um, I, I, to be honest, when I first got Sanesh and I first wrote lists, he was in every one of my lists. And I was writing uh, Fat Across, love it. And I was playing um, Glutos Armies. And um, yeah, Mitch, I remember the days too. Very fond and glad to see you back. Um, so, I, I think like Glutos is um one of those models that like is great and I think he's still viable and he's still good. And I him combined with Fiends. I wrote a list with him and Bellacor and a Fiend Star, and it's very you can get to minus two to hit, minus two to wound on the Fiends, and it's very, very obstructive. So old old or new Bellacor? New. No, no. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um obviously it's How um, would- Gone. Maybe my last burning question for you um, is: um, How do you think New Bellacor will slot into an army like this? Because some people might have gone out and bought Bellacor. Um, often was a really cool ally into Chaos armies, being at two hundred and forty points. But now mm. we've had some changes. Do you have any initial thoughts on Bellacor pre FAQ? He hasn't received an FAQ yet, but just any initial mm. thoughts? Yeah, I think he's great. Like, um, personally, he's an answer to a lot of stuff in the game that that you you just can't deal with, and he just shuts it off. Potentially, uh, he's good in combat. His spells great. You know, like enfeebling foe is minus one to wound. She got the shard speaker can um, can do a similar thing, and then fiends have it innately. You could even get to minus three to wound if you got really lucky with your spells and combos. Um, I think he is in one of my lists that I, I know it didn't, you didn't, um, yeah, pink Bellicle. Yeah, Byron's going to run Bellicle because he wants to paint in pink. Um, so he's definitely going with uh, a Bellicle in his list. And that's his, most of his list has him in because he was running actually Kairos Fate Weaver for much Ooh. the same thing. 
So a 400 point ally Kairos, it allows you to switch a charge off or, but Bellacore is just way more effective at that and way more, um, and cheaper. With, so he, with Dark Master. So, but he's yeah. still got a Kairos conversion that he's using. Um, so yeah, I mean, like in the list, the second list we talked about, drop the two untamed beasts, that's 140 points. Um, then you can drop the soul grinder that gives you up to 350 points and then you've got to spend 30 points so you could tr- change the end of the spell out or something like that and then you suddenly got bellacore um or you could just drop the mask for example and then that's 130 so you can you can find the points for bellacore uh, if you want to uh, i personally love love the model and i will be getting i've got one on order hopefully it will arrive i don't know if it's on back order or not i know it's been a bit of an issue i don't know how you guys are over over the other side of the world whether you've had the same problems but um um yes gabe i've i've turned him sorry i tempted him each on show we did and then he <laughs> fell, he fell down the rabbit hole i uh i thought i'd build a narrative um seraphon um little dinosaur army that quickly became two of the yeah. the those um <laughs> celeste though i quickly like in a matter of like two minutes i bought two boxes so i saw um yeah. it's it's very cool but like you know like maybe to end this show um i think what's awesome is you've got the twins coming as well and are they going to mm-hmm. be mini keepers of secrets are they going to be a actual keeper of secret tag team um are they going to be more powerful um like i think you know the the future is looking bright and when i think about this and when i think about my thoughts on slanesh when cities of sigma very first came out they didn't hit the tournament scene quickly um they didn't do very well at the tournaments and i think it was because we were learning a style and because it was such a deep book, we didn't understand the combinations. And it took a long time. And then people started to win. And it was through the list tech that, you know, we've now really unlocked the value of cities because we understand it. And I think Slanesh is, is, is in a very similar vein, is that yeah. there's going to be a little bit of pain. You're going to lose matches because Locust doesn't work like it used to. Depravity doesn't work like it used to. Things that you used to do aren't going to be as effective, but you've got all these new tools that are going to make you more robust and more flexible. And I think, you know, the run forward and smash people like the old Hagnar is not going to be around and it's not going to be viable. So don't just, just look at this as a new start, not cramming in what you used to do and expect it to work the same way. Yeah. And that that's happened a lot with books as they've been updated that if you take the old list and don't adapt, you just, then you go, Oh, it's got much worse. And it's like, well, the list has got worse but the book hasn't necessarily that much worse. You just need to find, I, I find it like you're on a little bit of a treasure hunt with Sanesh. And I think that the reward, that experience is fun. Like that, that just like trying to find the list that works for you is part of the fun and enjoyment of the hobby. Um, you know, and I think having the answer in front of you and then following someone else's narrative of copying them, and it doesn't mean it'll fit your style. They might not be the models you particularly want to do. Then you start trying to find ways to convert them to fit your style. And then because where it is, it then gets, you either take longer to get to table. You're on a delay as well because you, it's already been used, painted, built and painted and used and successful. You copy it. By the time you've got it there, it's either getting changed or it's no longer as successful as it was. And you don't understand it as well as the person who built it from the ground up. So my advice is always build your own list from the ground up and take inspiration from other things and talk to other players, but don't copy because end of the day, it ain't ever going to be as good as if you did it yourself from the the start because you learn as you go. And Well, well, additions change, um, meta changes, and once you understand the core mechanics, uh, you make better decisions and you can tweak to the meta while some people don't adapt as well to the meta because they don't understand what is... um, what is the meta and how do you how do you respond to the supercasters of you know the the zenches the teclases the nagashes you know grave lords is coming who knows what that's going to what they're going to bring to the table um like lumineth has obviously had its second wave so you know learn the mistakes and um yeah no i think i think it's a good time i th- i think i think the positivity is starting to come back in the slanish community and i hope this helps your thoughts on how to look at your army folks yeah um yeah it's i def- definitely think it's uh it's not as bad as people think it is That's what I'll put 
any shout outs, any final comments you want to, you want to bring us home? You want to say anything? Um, well, I mean, obviously if you want to know more Sinesh stuff, we've got about four videos up on our channel. You could check out and that's, we've got a depravity deep dive, a Sigvold show. We've got, um, the initial interaction. You can even see the journey as we change our opinion. I know we'll be doing more follow-ups because Byron's well into it. Um, yeah, I'd just say like, just, just, if you want to play Sinesh, play Sinesh. Don't let, don't let people put you off. Don't feel like you've wasted all your money, um, playing, you know, you know, buying all the models and then you think, oh, they're not, they're not viable. You can still use them. AOS is fast moving enough that you don't have to wait very long for things to come back around. So just. You're, you're talking to the guy who, who just went four and one at a tournament with what the internet declared as the worst battle tome ever created in, in time and space. I didn't. Um, no, not you. I'm just like you gen <laughs> yeah, yeah. generally oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like the internet raged so mm. much about Gargans and like, Oh, the Gargans are the worst. We hate them. They're the shittest army. Like you can't win. There's no battalions. Yeah. Like, you know, Vince put like a million presentations up and PowerPoints and graphs. And the reality is, it's like you learn, you adapt. Um, the and, is, and with sons, they're great at objective play. But when you read the book, that's not obvious. You get them on the table, you, you you lose all your models by turn four. You've won the game. You still win the game. You're still doing well at the tournament. Um, I played three games with them. Back, I was lucky enough when the lockdown was a little bit eased to play a free game, one day event, and they absolutely, I absolutely smashed face. And I smashed, I played OVR. I played I played Big War. I played um flesh eaters and no problem on every mission not a problem and these are against season tournament players it wasn't like i was playing club gamers or anything so yeah i definitely knew they were good and uh, I, I've, it's good to see you doing well with them because i've seen you've been uh been successful so that's great so it, it just proves a point like if people are if you know people are, are getting negative it's it's not like giving up it's like finding a way and um and, and that's how you will just become really good as a player, but also um, you'll be there for the peaks and the troughs. And each, even, you know, even in their worst, the, each victory will be sweeter and there's nothing to lose. So it's like sports, enjoy the book. You have your highs and lows. When you're low, it's nice to be picked up. I mean, you need a coach to tell you to dust yourself off and get back in the game. So Sinesh players, you feel like you're, you know, you're just taking a beat down, dust yourself off. Have a rethink, get back in the game, and win some win some Warhammer. You'll be there. It's fine. No, I dig it. But Russ, this is awesome. Um, Face Hammer's link is below. Go check them out. Subscribe. They do lots of cool content. Um, they are very competitive players as well, as you mentioned. Um, they represent England at the various world tournaments, uh, formerly ETC, now World. So um, you are getting some good quality content. Um, go subscribe. Go check them out. And uh, Russ, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing no and giving me more clarity. I think for me, when I picked up this book for the first time, I'm like, yeah, I kind of get it, but I haven't had the experience. And this has put some of my thinking into practice, but also challenged some of the thoughts that I initially had. And like, now I've got new ways to consider um, the Slanesh and the twins are just going to, who knows what it's going to do. They're, they're just they're so exciting. The, how much the potential that they could bring to the book. Um, and also they, they look like they're on tree lord bases, so they look like a slightly kind of around the same sort of size or similar size as a keeper, but slightly smaller. I, I can't wait to see see the reaction of when they drop. Obviously, I know what they do, so I'm gonna have to keep myself quite quiet. Oh, damn it, damn it, <laughs> damn it. Must be, yeah, that sucks. We but... will cover that, I'm sure, when they drop. I'm sure you will too. <laughs> I'm sure we'll all cover them because they are awesome models. But, Russ, thank you for your time. Everyone who watched the stream live, thank you so much. You know yeah, the deal so. like, subscribe, hashtag best video. Russ is amazing. Yeah. Coach's beard smells like. Um, I think I'm wearing uh, minty oil at the moment. So my beard smells like mint, oh, you... but. Oh, that's weird. What do you mean? <laughs> my, it's like my brush. <laughs> I did it's say like a horse brush. Whole beard tech of scented beard. Oh, oh, oh there is. No oh, you, you don't want to know. Maybe they, they, <laughs> like, that's for the only. You can't the only fans. cake or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you guys. Let's wrap this up. Bye. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. 
The champions over here are my AOS coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with a link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.